Hi guys, thought you might be interested to see this. Uh, I did mention actually on a previous video that I was going to be working on this project. This is uh, an Amiga 500 Plus case uh, with a Pi 4 installed, uh, but it's got uh, an Amiga 500 keyboard as you can see, and uh, an Arduino Leonardo as the keyboard interface. I'll show you the guts of the machine in a bit, but uh, I'll walk you through how it's configured and, uh, and what you can do with it. Okay, so as we're waiting for this to uh, to boot up, um, hopefully you'll be able to see the power LED here in green and the drive light in red. There's still a little bit of bleed through from the uh, from the red uh, drive LED, so I need to put a bit more uh, shielding around the uh, the green LED and stop that. But that's only minor, and it's currently configured with Diet Pi. And on top of that, we've got Amiberry currently version 4.1.5, only because that's what came with this uh, particular image and I haven't got around to, uh, to upgrading a copy of Amiberry yet. If I just zoom this in a fraction. So this is running uh, Amiga OS 3.2. There's a few other bits and pieces and I'll walk you through some of that. If you've seen some of my previous videos, uh, you may well recognize the build. Okay, so on Amiberry, the um, default key to bring up the menu is F12. Obviously, because we're using an Amiga 500 uh, keyboard, there is no F12. So I've mapped the menu to the help button. So if I press that now, you can see we've got the configuration here. I'll just step you through that. So we're going to look at default. Uh, we can see that the CPU is set to a 68040. Uh, FPU is using CPU internal more compatible checked on both. We're not using JIT because uh, I found that that gives um, misleading results in terms of the performance. I've set the CPU to fastest because we want a bit of extra performance here uh, because we're also using it for, uh, for web browsing for what it's worth. Uh, we've got the chipset set to A4000 uh, and an AGA. We're using a 3.2 A4000 uh, Kickstart ROM. RAM, we've got two megs of chip, eight megs of fast, and 128 megs of uh, Z3. We've got two floppy drives defined there. Uh, we've got a number of disk partitions. And we've also got a UAE Zorro 3 RTG with 128 megs of RAM. What else is worth looking at? So display, we've got it set up at um, 1280 by 720, so 720p. Full screen, uh, 720 by 400. Uh, we've set the resolution for the Amiga, and we've got the resolution set to high res. Uh, other than that, centering um, set on for both horizontal and vertical. Uh, input, you can see here, we're using the uh, C64 joystick in this case. I want to show you. Oh, very similar to a competition pro. And that's about it. And you can see here the open GUI or the menu option is set to page up. In this case, page up is the equivalent of the help button on Amiga 500. So that's about it. If we just resume that, let me show you some of the, uh, the features on here. So we've already said we've got it set up for RTG. If we go into prefs and screen mode, we can see we're using 720 by 432 bit, which I found to be about optimum. So one, when you're in Workbench, um, that is actually a 16 by nine resolution. So we're not cheating, we're not stretching. Um, that genuinely is 16 nine. Okay, and if we look at the overscan, you can see we've already set the screen edges correctly. Obviously, some of these settings are, are more specific to um, Amiga OS 3.2. And as you'll have clocked on previous videos, we're using the 1.x palette. And I'll show you how to do that in case you wanted to know. So go into Press and then Palette. What we can do is select new look preset and kick 1.x style and that'll basically set this up there's a couple of things you have to do after that um, but that's pretty much it and the rest of it you should be able to follow your nose to work it out okay 
So let's see how this thing performs. Okay, let's just show you this first. So we've got um, Dopus 4 installed. And the reason we've gone for Dopus 4 instead of Dopus 5 is purely because I prefer Dopus 4. Um, but that works absolutely fine. Okay, and we've also got sysinfo. Okay, so just using sysinfo to do a speed test. Let's run it again. And you can see there it's reporting 1.55 times the speed of an A4000 with a 68040 at 25 megahertz, which is probably about what I'd expect. Internet browsing here, so this is just using the built-in uh, IP stack. Um, it does actually have a, a copy of Roadshow installed, but we're not really using that at this stage because we don't have a separate network card uh, driver installed at the moment. But you can see with the benefit of the RTG drivers, the inline images do actually come up quite quickly. If we were to set it back to PAL or NTSC and not use the RTG, that would come up quite a bit slower. And you can see the browsing experience is perfectly reasonable, uh, as long as you don't want to do anything too sophisticated with it. If you just want to download stuff from AmiNet or look something up on Wikipedia, it's fine. Okay, and I'll just prove very quickly that music's working. So these are just mod files. Like a random one. Okay, there you go, that's working fine. And then let's go into iGame. Now iGame supported on um, anything from a 68020 onwards. So this image uh, was originally built for a 68020. It's for the purposes of um, OS 3.2. It's been patched up for a 68040 CPU, but essentially it's the, the same build. So if we just have a quick look at some of these, let's have a look at Juggler. We can skip the uh, start screen. Okay, there you go. And it's print screen to exit this demo. And being an Amiga 500 keyboard, print screen is actually correctly mapped to print screen. Might not sound like a big deal, but uh, <laughs> when you're using a non-Amiga keyboard, a PC keyboard, for example, it would typically be, if you've got a number pad, the asterisk. So it's nice that it's correctly mapped. And let's have a look at something else, like state of the art. Okay, so no problem with state of the art. Uh, let's look at a game, uh, maybe Pac Mania. Okay, so we can see it's pretty much coming up full screen. A little bit of um, blank space either side, but not too serious. It's pretty reasonable. Yep, and all the controls on the joystick are working as expected, and the gameplay is pretty responsive. Okay, we won't play all of that, put it out there. And most of the games are going to give a similar experience. I'll show you Zool.
So there you go, again, utilizing most of the screen. And the gameplay is pretty reasonable. It's quite responsive, actually. Okay, print screen had come out of that one. Okay. So that's about it for the build. Let's have a look under the hood. Hi guys, if you found this video useful or interesting and you want to see more of the same, please do um, click like and uh, feel free to subscribe. Thanks a lot. Okay, going to go freehand for this a little bit. So let's have a look around the back of the machine. Now, this is still a fairly early prototype. Um, there's still a bit of, bit of work to be done, a bit of tidying up. But you can see here we've got uh, two DB9 connectors and joystick adapters. Uh, these are monster joystick joystick adapters, so they will actually work with old school uh, Amiga joysticks, but uh, they're not currently connected inside the machine. Um, they could be, and they do work, but um, sorry, excuse the camera work. But the reason they're not at the moment is because we do actually have a little bit of an issue with our power budget, which I'll come on to. Um, so that's something for uh, for another day to sort out. The Audio connections um, are actually connected up to the, uh, the Raspberry Pi inside. We've got two USB connections presented on the back. Two ports here are currently unused, so they'll end up with banking plates over the top. We've got our HDMI connection here, slightly wonky, but never mind. And we've got our 5 volt barrel connection just here. So that's pretty much it for the outside of the machine. I'll tell you more about the drive light LED in a second. And as it stands, there's no floppy drive installed in the machine. We've got a cut down GoTech bracket, which you may have seen on a previous video for the um, Amiga 500 Mr. FPGA, which is a very similar project in many respects. So that's not a permanent fixture on this machine uh, because Amiberry 416 and above, 416 at the time of making this video is still the current version, but um, Amiberry 416 does actually support both Grease Weasel and the uh, Rob Smith Arduino uh, floppy sport. So if you can see here, we've got a Grease Weasel interface and we've got a standard PC floppy drive. But theory is the Grease Weasel uh, interface, if we were to use a straight through floppy cable as opposed to a cross, uh, it could be used with an Amiga floppy drive. So either or, and the intention is that that'll be installed in the machine. Um, but we'll probably wait until the next release of Amiberry because I know they're working on a few enhancements and, uh, and bug fixes so hopefully in 417 or whatever version it's going to be um, the support will be just that little bit improved but it does work even in, in 416 it's just a, a few little issues with it as it stands. Okay so um, we'll, uh, we'll pop the lid off and I'll give you a quick walkthrough inside the machine. Cover off, let's see what we've got. So we've got an Amiga 500 keyboard, as you'd expect. Um, we are using an Arduino Leonardo uh, here to act as the keyboard interface. So essentially what that's doing is that's converting the signaling for the Amiga keyboard. You can see the connectors just here. Uh, to USB and this is exactly the same arrangement as uh, as I use in the Mr. Mr. FPGA Omega 500 or Omega 500 FPGA APEC and that comes round and uses one of the USB ports here on the Pi 4. Let me just shift the keyboard out of the way for a second. Okay so whilst we're talking about the Pi 4 so this is a, a Pi 4 8 gig version, not that it really matters. Um, a 2 gig version would probably be fine. Uh, we've got our HDMI here, so obviously on a Pi 4, this is a micro HDMI. 
that's being converted to a standard HDMI and presented on the back. We've got our 5 volt power coming in. We're splitting it here just in case I need a supply for anything else, like maybe a floppy drive in the future. So that's that's for future expansion, development, whatever. Uh, but essentially we're bringing that 5 volt in, uh, we're converting it to USB-C and we're feeding the power in there. We've got um, a heatsink here, fairly chunky heatsink case actually, and we're also permanently driving the two fans here. We're also taking a feed here using ground and GPIO pin 19 in this case, but you could pretty much use any appropriate uh, GPIO pin. And we're using that to drive an LED, in this case, a red LED, which literally just sits in here. Now, we're not using the LED for the drive uh, drive light that's um, on the keyboard and that's just because the Arduino has not been configured in such a way that it will carry the signaling so it's easier just to feed it directly from the Pi that's basically the deal and if you can see we're just using a little bit of black insulation tape it needs a bit more on there actually um, to block the uh, the light coming from the red drive LED to stop it wiping out the uh, the green power LED that needs a little bit more tweaking but it basically works from the back we'd already looked at the usb ports but you can see they're going into the two usb 3 ports on the pi 4. we've got our two audio ports or our rcas um, and they're being converted to a three and a half mil stereo jack that's going into the pi 4 there there's our two monster joysticks stick adapters they do work but they're not currently connected just because we've got a bit of a problem with power budget at the moment uh, which i'll come on to so the arduino uh, really really good bit of kit but um, it's a little power hungry the keyboard does occasionally blip out which is a little annoying to say the least and we've also got quite a long run on the usb cable if you can see that going around that's just the one that was supplied with it um <laughs> so i've got a shorter one coming uh, but i don't don't have one in stock as it stands so two things i'm going to do to uh, to try and improve the situation with that i'm going to take a feed from this power um, supply that we tapped off from the main supply input and i'm going to use that to drive um, a powered usb hub and then from there have a short usb cable to drive the uh, the Leonardo so hopefully we won't see quite such a, a significant drop off in the power and the uh, the connection will be a bit more stable but we'll see how it goes so really that's pretty much it for the guts of the machine obviously when we put the floppy drive in using the grease weasel we're going to have to have a little bit of a reorg so the Arduino is probably going to have to move kind of up here somewhere the floppy drive will then go in on the existing brackets uh, the intention is to use uh, an actual amiga floppy drive um, and the grease weasel interface well that's not very big so that'll go wherever possibly even just underneath the floppy drive um, so that's that's about it it's pretty simple not much to it at all obviously wi-fi and bluetooth are built in on the uh, on the raspberry pi so connectivity is not an issue one original Amiga 500 tank mouse. Now, if you've seen the Amiga 500 Mr. FPGA, you probably know where we're going with this. Um, this is a USB to DB9 adapter, which has had its firmware programmed up to, uh, to interface with the Amiga mouse. Amiga mouse being neither serial or USB. It's got proprietary signaling so that's why you need this one final thing that i should tell you about the power supply that we're using is actually a 5.25 volt power supply um, because even though the pi is rated at five volts um, i actually find that the uh, 5.25 volt power supply helps avoid some of the problems with um, under voltage 
warnings coming up on the screen and throttling the machine back. So you see this is this is an approved power supply for a, for a Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, your experience may vary, but uh, but that seems to have addressed some of the issues that I had uh, trying to power this particular machine and and others. So let's pop that back in. Now I'm not currently using um, an inline switch just because also I find that quite often they'll throttle the power back a little bit. What we're doing here though, this um, this power supply has got a USB-C connector there and we're just using a, a USB-C to barrel connector so that we can keep the barrel connector on the back of the machine. Again, personal preference, if you're happy to use USB-C, then great, stick with it. But uh, I was trying to keep the build of this machine as close to the one of the um, Amiga 500 Mr. Uh, FPGA. So here you can see exactly what I'm talking about. The drive light's flashing, but because we don't have quite enough shielding, I read that as black, <laughs> black insulation tape around the uh, the green power LED. We're getting a little bit of bleed through, but that's an easy fix, obviously. Okay, guys, right, there you go. Um, that's about it for the time being. Hopefully that was of some interest um, and maybe gives you a couple of tips if you're thinking about doing something similar so you don't make the uh, fall into the same pitfalls as, as I have with some of these things, power budget being the main one, um, especially for the, uh, for the Arduino. But, uh, but otherwise, um, I will catch you on the next one. Cheers for now.